I'm Douglas Mason, CEO of Naturally Splendid, symbol NSP on the TSX Venture Exchange. Naturally Splendid is a biotechnology and consumer products company focused on the global cannabis and health markets. Naturally Splendid is expanding distribution in this rapidly growing market with products currently in Canada, the USA, South Korea, Germany, and Australia. To view our comprehensive company presentation and for more information, please visit our website at naturallysplendid.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is home ownership consultant Ross Kay from the wealthyhomeowner.ca. Welcome back to the show, Ross. And thanks for having me back, Jim. Ross, with your claims of housing markets correcting in three of the four provincial housing markets, BC, Alberta, Ontario, what expected outcomes have these corrections currently have remained that have been unmentioned? Well, I think uh, for those three markets, I mean, you got you've got a little bit a little bit different in each province, Jim. Uh, I, in in Ontario here, you've got a false belief that the Toronto housing market is starting to get busier again, um, and that prices are rising when, in fact, prices are declining. In other words, the, the same house year over year would sell for less in 2019 today than it would in 2018 or 2017, for that matter. Um, the housing market did not get busier. The, uh, the, house, the way that the local real estate boards are publishing their data gives the illusion of that happening. Um, they were claiming double-digit gains here in Ontario in sales, and in other words, over 10% uh, year-over-year comparison to sale, which which is an absolute ludicrous uh, comment because it's false. Alberta, Alberta, you've got homeowners in Alberta on average have lost $60,000 in inflation-adjusted uh, home equity since uh, 2014. On average, they've lost $60,000 inflation-adjusted home equity since uh, 2014. This has gone not talked about. I mean, the fi- that's, a, that's financially devastating for families, Jim. A loss of $60,000, especially if you're looking to use your house as retirement. Well, what about we these... these go- I was going to say, what about these governments? I know we'll, we'll get back to what we were talking to or talking about, but uh, governments like B.C., Carol James, the finance minister has a big smile on her face when she says we have helped bring house prices down. She doesn't talk about, she has no targets, by the way, for, well, how far do you want them to go down? And, and when do you stop putting your uh, foot on the throat of people who would like to see some equity in their homes and perhaps security for their retirement? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent point. And, and let's, let's just go right to BC right now because, because you brought it up. I mean, there's no question. You have to understand. Uh, for some reason, I believe uh, Ms. James does not think about this. Over 50% of your voters are homeowners. If you look at, I think you've got around a 63% home ownership rate in British Columbia. And, of course, we that means that the, the younger people, those below, uh, say, 28, generally don't own homes. Uh, they also are less apt to vote. But the more, those that are more apt to vote happen to be homeowners. And those homeowners are watching their home equity plummet in British Columbia. Now, I can understand they wanted to throw out the Liberals after the absolutely insane approach that the Liberals uh, took to uh, the housing file in British Columbia. But the truth of the matter is, is that they really had no bearing on the the housing market correcting. In other words, the housing market was correcting well in advance of any of the policies they brought to bear uh, actually being enacted. And and data proves this. I don't care about the stats. The data proves this. And this is not even a debatable uh, subject when you're looking at the data that we're looking at. it. The housing market was already correcting. So to sit there and be gloating over people losing home equity, losing wealth, it would sort of be like someone gloating over the stock market deflating in price. 
Now, I understand people who currently do not own a home who are looking to get into the housing market are generally the most vocal in the society. Um, that they, they, they are also the most social media savvy. Well, to those people, I'd say, look, you got 130, 140,000 foreign students currently enrolled in uh, public institutions there in uh, in uh, British Columbia. There's a hundred and because of that 130,000, you've also got parents who come with some of the younger kids who are uh, in in the public school system in the foreign students in the public school system who are paying like $15,000 a year, um, their, their parents come with them. So that's, that's, that's more people. I'm estimating you've got somewhere in the neighborhood of 210 to 220,000 bedrooms currently occupied in, uh, in British Columbia by, by foreigners, people who don't live here, people who don't pay taxes here. You haven't heard a single university, Andy Ann, that Davidoff, all these guys, uh, uh, Gordon, wh- where are they speaking up about the foreign students taking away homes from Canadian kids? Where is Generation Squeeze, Paul Kershaw, where is he speaking up? He doesn't even appear on his website. How come? Well, it's because they're generating revenues, their jobs, from foreign students. So they don't want to look at the most, the biggest cause of the problem you have there which is foreign students occupying bedrooms that should be occupied by Canadians. Now, there would be nothing wrong with Simon Fraser or UBC building ahead of bringing new students in, residential buildings for those students, for those students to live in the entirety of the time that they're in Canada. But, of course, the the universities can't afford that. So instead, they put that weight to bear on the population at large, and then they remain silent about it. Well, guess what, Jim? We're seeing some consequences take place right now. If you look at the heat maps of housing prices, assessment value in uh, Vancouver, you're going to see now there is a substantial number of homes previously worth over $3 million are now worth less than $3 million. That means the number of homeowners paying the school, edu- the school educa- education tax on homes over $3 million is decreasing. The value of the homes over $3 million is also decreasing. So the, the, in, the, the planned income through that policy, which was false, a, a bad policy on the day it was launched, are decreasing. It isn't doing anyone any good. It isn't solving any problems. It's creating more problems because this is the next problem that's going to happen. And it's going to arrive when you get your July 2019 assessments for the greater Vancouver area. What you're going to see is because of the un, the historic decline in values of single detached homes in, uh, in Vancouver itself, the owners of condominiums in Vancouver their property taxes are going to go up, while the owners of the single detached homes are going to see their property taxes slashed. That means the foreign owners who own single detached homes in Calgary or in in Vancouver are going to be paying less municipal property tax. If their houses moved from 3.1 million to 2.9 or 2.6 or 2.4 million, they are no longer going to pay the 3% surcharge for the education tax. That is going to have to be made up by taxpayers as well. So the young millennials, I mean, this, this, this is where, of, of all the provincial housing markets, BC is the most messed up, Jim. Because in 2017, the Liberal government incentivized young millennial families young families, first-time buyers, to enter the housing market with that $37,000 first-time buyer loan. That caused the the condo market to artificially record higher housing prices during 2017 and early 2018. We are now hearing those condominium prices are starting to drop. But you have to remember, they're not dropping 
to the same magnitude that the single detached are. Since property taxes are based on a mill rate, or the amount of property taxes you're going to pay for each thousand dollars of value your home is worth, it means the mill rate is probably going to have to go up in, in Vancouver to offset the uh, declines in value in order for the governments simply to have the same tax revenue from municipal taxes that they had last year. That means the wealthiest people who now own homes below $3 million are getting a windfall in property tax reductions that those young families who bought homes in 2017, condominiums, are going to have to make up for. So coast to coast, Jim, you mentioned about Carol James bragging about housing markets. I do not believe, Jim, anywhere in the world politicians have bragged about housing price, them establishing a policy that caused the value of homes owned by homeowners to decline, except in British Columbia. Maybe someone can go out there and find someplace else, but I'm saying off the top of my head, I certainly in, in Canada, I can never remember a single politician bragging about home equity losses across their voter base. In BC, that's exactly happening. In Alberta, it's been a $60,000 hit per home in Alberta. In Ontario, home prices are lower in 20 Home buyers are paying less money for the identical home in 2019 than they were in 2018. In other words, those home values have dropped. What you don't hear in Alberta and Ontario are governments lauding house price declines. Only in B.C., only in B.C., where the craziest politicians in the country exist, the craziest policies in the country exist as it relates to home ownership, do you hear these kind of comments being made? We'll have more with Ross K. right after this. Media recognition from Bloomberg, Writers, Recycling Trade Publications, patented process for 100% recovery of critical metals, including cobalt, lithium, nickel, manganese, aluminum. American Manganese is focused on recycling lithium-ion batteries for electric vehicles. American Manganese trades on the TSX Venture, AMY, the U.S., AMYZF, and Frankfurt 2AM. For more information, visit AmericanManganeseInc.com or phone me, Larry Ray, at 778-574-4444. Hi, I'm Douglas Mason, President and CEO of Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp, RMO on the TSX Venture Exchange. Rainy Mountain Royalty Corp is a Canadian-based mineral exploration project generator. The company currently holds multiple property interests in Ontario with joint venture partners and is seeking further joint venture partners for other drill-ready properties in our portfolio. For more information, please visit our website at rmroyalty.com or call me at 604-922-2030. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, a listener in Vancouver looking to move back to Ontario. Why would you do that? Moving <laughs> back to Ontario was asking how the condo markets are doing in Vancouver and Toronto. She wants to sell in Vancouver, buy in TO. When the timing is right, is the timing right? Okay, so you smart guy, Jim. Laughing about why would someone want to move back from Vancouver to Toronto. Well, let's say if you cut your homeowner expense, by 40%. Let's say you're able to transfer back and take a 10% wage decrease, but you're able to slash your home ownership expense by 40%. Well, I would say that would be a smart financial move for a young family to do. That said, you're not going to be living in Vancouver anymore. Uh, you're not going to have that quality of life. You're going to have to seek out a different quality of life here in Ontario for those people. Forget about golf. Be, I was going to say forget about golfing in January. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You, you're not going to golf in January, but, uh, you know, you, you probably have more money. You probably can own a car. You probably won't spend as much money, as much time in uh, transit. Um, you probably won't be, be dealing with all of the, uh, the racial overtones that have been ongoing in, uh, in Vancouver because the, false blame being placed on foreign buyers uh, uh, causing the house price gains instead of it being blamed at the 
the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver and the Fraser Valley Real Estate Board and the British Columbia Real Estate Association. Those are the three bodies who have lied to the public, in my opinion. Um, but the, the, the people are asking, what, is there a difference in the two condo markets? Of course there is. In Ontario, the government was not foolish enough to incentivize first-time buyers with a $37,000 boost to their down payment like happened in Vancouver. And they weren't foolish enough to only leave it in place for 365 days and then remove it from the market. You were having quicker house price declines in the condo market in Vancouver right now than you are in Toronto. So the condo market has rolled over in Vancouver well in advance of uh, of Toronto's rolling over. So the the people who own condos in in Vancouver who who are if they're considering moving back to Ontario usually they would be moving back looking to buy a single detached home that's usually the motivation you're not going to have someone being motivated to move back to Ontario to buy another condo um, those people um, are probably losing right now because they didn't act last year they listened to all the propaganda that half the condo prices were still going up in 2018. Instead of realizing condo prices were going were going to start drop, you just had to wait for that false thirty seven thousand dollars to be re- be removed. Single detached homes in in Ontario, depending on the city that you're buying in, have dropped greatly in in the same period of time. So your mortgage your mortgage should be smaller. So yes, you want to make these moves when the timing is right, but it's no more important from a Vancouver condo buyer moving back to Ontario who wants to buy a single detached home. It's no different than someone living in a condo in Toronto who would like to buy a single detached home out in uh, a Kitchener-Waterloo, for the sake of the art, or, or Burlington, my hometown, or Oakville, or St. Catharines. Housing markets are moving always in two different, uh, never moving the same pattern. So your housing market in Toronto for condos will not be moving the same way that a single detached market is moving in in Mississauga, a short 10-minute drive away. Those two markets will be moving totally opposite to one another. And the price pressures, supply and demand, on the category of home, uh, those two totally different categories of homes are totally different. Those supply and demand pressures change during the course of a year. You always want to be buying, selling, when the price pressure is best uh, for you as a seller to get the highest price possible, and you want to be buying when the category of home that you're you're looking to buy ha- is experienced its lowest price point pressure, or or better yet, the greatest house price decline. These two things never match up, so you've got to stagger your closing dates. You've got to stagger your moves. You may take a short-term rental. You may take a long closing on your existing property and a short closing on your new one. All of these these things come into bear, Jim. And very seldom, very seldom is there an opportunity where you should sell today and buy your next house tomorrow. Almost never does that exist. There is a period of time that you need to delay. Historically, Historically, trading data shows the vast amount of sales that take place in, uh, for sake of, in, in Ontario, in, uh, in, in, uh, April and May and June are the result of people who had sold their homes way back in January and February. People actually believe the housing market gets busier in April, May, and June, and they call it the spring market, and that's hogwash. What it is is that people had already sold their homes. They're waiting for the properties they would like to buy to come on the market, and then when those houses get listed in April, May, and June, they jump on them. It's not that the market has gotten busier then. It just means that there's people that are delaying waiting to see what they're able to buy. And as soon as it comes to market, they buy it. So obviously, if you're a seller, you want to be listing your property 
at the time when the group of buyers who target your property are the most active. These are all cyclical in pattern. Uh, they are, they are long-standing trends. It is the basis for what a, how all, all housing markets function. And in all honesty, Jim, it's the general reason why most of the myths about housing markets and housing prices exist. We'll have more with Ross K. right after the break. Cypress Development Corp. is developing a world-class lithium resource in the heart of Clayton Valley, Nevada. The size of the resource makes the Clayton Valley project a premier asset with the potential to impact the future of lithium supply. Cypress Development Corp. trades on the TSX Venture Exchange, symbol CYP, the OTCQB, symbol CYDVF, and on Frankfurt, symbol C1Z1. For more information, please visit our website, cypressdevelopmentcorp.com. Don't miss out. Stay informed. Receive the HowStreet.com weekly recap with thought-provoking podcasts, radio, and articles delivered to your inbox. Sign up for the HowStreet.com weekly recap on our homepage at HowStreet.com. Welcome back. We're speaking with Ross K. Ross, a listener, commented that their mortgage was coming up for renewal, and they were wondering about choosing a short-term or long-term mortgage with the rates that are available today. Okay, well, let's do a bit of an, 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 an inter, interactive here, Jim. The, uh, let, let's let you be the uh, the person in question. You're a, uh, a a young you you are the father in a young family. You're, you're 32 years old. You just purchased your first house two years ago. Your mortgage is now coming up for a renewal. And although you've got a good job, looking forward you're concerned that a recession could hit. And if that recession hits, you, being one of the newer employees in the firm, could be laid off. Now, that's who you are in answering this question. And the question is this. I ask you, Jim, if you could take out a mortgage when it comes up for renewal that guarantees your payment is going to be $1,000 for the next five years, or you could take a mortgage that's going to, where you're going to have to pay $950 for the next two years. But two years from now, when it comes to renew, you risk having the mortgage renew at $1,100. At the same time, there's a possibility you could be laid off. And if that's the case, the bank may decide not to renew your mortgage. Would you prefer to take the five-year term? Of course would you, you would. Gamble I would take the, the five-year. Sure you would. And why you you did that for what reason, Jim? Well, what is they, the primary reason you decided? In case you lost your job, they're not going to uh, pull your mortgage on you. Right. You want to eliminate the risk. So when we look at mortgage terms, the answer to this question is very simple. The longer the mortgage term you take, you are assuming a, 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 the lender is assuming a higher degree of risk. Now, what I can tell your listeners is, is that mortgage data for the last 50 years allows us to calculate with a pretty high accuracy what, what your mortgage uh, expense is going to be over a 5, 10, or even a 25 year window. So, so the data is available to come up with those numbers. But what I will also tell you is, is how you should look at a long-term mortgage as insurance. You should look at the difference in the, in the payment that you're going to make and the, the, the possible interest rate, interest that you would save over the length of the term, whether it's, whether it's three, five, or ten years, or seven or ten years. What I would tell your listeners is this. If you were in a home, the average Canadian stays in their home over 12 years before they move. So don't believe all of the myths out there about how people move every five years or people move every seven years. Over the last 50 years, including this last period we've had, the average homeowner will live in their home over 12 years. So that means a 10-year mortgage for the average homeowner is going to be okay. Now, if something happens that you need to uh, get out of that mortgage early, there's many ways to get out of them. 
There's a penalty associated with it, which we call insurance. I'm, I'm talking about the wealthy homeowner. This discussion about short-term mortgages or long-term mortgages simply ask, should be asked instead, how much insurance are you willing to pay to eliminate risk? And when you do the calculation of the short term and then the risk when it comes to renew uh, later, or you take a long term where there is no risk at the re- at uh, renewal for the length of term of the mortgage, the difference in cost is simply the insurance payment that you're going to make. And I can tell your listeners this. After dealing with thousands of families, over decades of them owning their homes. I have never had a family ever regret taking a long-term mortgage. I have had thousands of families regret taking short-term mortgages. The reason why the long-term mortgage never is bothered by it is because it was a security. They can frame their entire financial life around that mortgage. They have a certainty of life based around that mortgage. Before they borrow more money, they know that for the length of the term, their mortgage debt, their mortgage payment is not going to change. They can look at their property tax and they can figure that expense more readily on a long-term mortgage. That isn't to say that I'm recommending long-term mortgages. There are many, many, many Again, would have been thousands of times over the course of mortgage renewals that my, my clients that I've worked with where I would have said, you're ideal to take a short-term, short-term mortgage. Usually those short terms, though, were six months. And then at the six months, you, you always tie, had a mortgage broker who carried a mortgage a, a pre-approval for you somewhere else that was locked in. Now, that takes a lot of work. You're not going, I know many people have done it, but it's not common. You need a mortgage broker to do that for you. The mortgage broker, you should be paying separate from arranging the mortgage. You should be paying them for mortgage arranging services because you want them to tell you what they believe is going to be the best time for you to renew. You want them to be watching the market for you because they should be experts. The person that you're hiring as a mortgage broker should be an expert. They should be looking at mortgage data. They should be looking at the Canadian bank's bottom lines. They should know which bank you're currently dealing with because the bank, the the interest rate profile for that bank going for the next uh, two or three years will be totally different than another bank. They should be looking at Um, interest rates in the states. They should be looking at bond rates. They should be looking at unemployment rates. They should be looking at the amount of mortgage debt, new mortgage debt being taken taken on. All of those factors, which are really beyond, who wants to watch that every single day of their life? You want to go to work, pay your mortgage, take a holiday when you can, go watch the kids play soccer, Go in your, out, in, the, out in, in your garage, work in the car. Go, go out in the backyard, work in the garden. Go down to the local pub, have a beer with your buddies. Um, go with the local girls down to uh, the yoga class and work out. You don't want to be tracking these things, especially at the low cost. These professionals will do this for you. Most of them will refund you the fee when you finally book the mortgage again because they'll get a referral, they'll get a mortgage referral fee from the bank or the lender, whoever you're choosing. So that's how I would have to answer the, the question to this to this listener, Jim. I would say that long and short term mortgages, the difference in the rate, are a calculation of the insurance, a risk premium. It's no different than when you took out your first mortgage and probably had to pay CMHC insurance. You paid a risk premium. Just simply add that risk premium that you're paying into your into the into your home ownership expense and decide whether it's worthwhile for you or not. All I can tell you is thousands upon thousands of mortgage renewals 
very, very I cannot remember. A sincere, I mean, you always have outliers where people who complain at everything. But I can't remember a regular homeowner ever saying, hey, Ross, I, I should have taken the short term and I'm really upset about it. I've had a lot of, a lot of people say, hey, we should have took that long term rate. And anybody who missed November of 2017, you were saying that in, in the spring of 2018. Ah, we should have taken that rate. You've got tremendously low rates right now. The flip side, I want your listeners to understand this. The only people who do not want you to take long-term mortgages are the following. Number one, mortgage brokers. Number two, realtors. Number three, the banks. Those three stakeholders do not want you to take longer-term mortgages. The reason why is for each service that they're providing. Mortgage brokers like to get their their, uh, renewals in, and they like to have a steady cash flow. You have a two-year mortgage, and your client returns every two years. you got a new referral fee every two years. Realtors, the longer you take a term mortgage, the longer you're going to stay in your house. The realtor gets fewer turnovers, fewer trades from a family. If you eliminate one house trade as you work your way up the property ladder, it equals over $100,000 in wealth building over the, over your lifetime of ownership. That was a commission the realtors are counting on. They want you to move as many times as possible. And then you have the bank. The banks like to have you and, and have themselves be in the position of power where they're granting you permissions over and over again on the amount of mortgage money they'll lend you. They also want to manipulate the rates. In the short-term gains, the banks have a great way of maximizing their profit, their profits. Long range, they've removed you from their, from their calculations. They now know what, 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 what kind of profits you're going to generate for them long term. Those three stakeholders always want you to take short-term rates, which is why the vast majority of mortgage advice that appears in print is for is that you're always going to win taking a short-term rate. Human behavior dictates just the opposite. Your life often is going to be fuller because of the security and the stability you have in a re- reliable monthly house expense payment which includes your mortgage interest. Ross, the listener wants to know, what's the best deal, a brand new home or a resale right now? Well, this is, this is another great question, Jim, and, and, and it really relates to who you are as a home buyer. So if you are a home buyer who values a large backyard, a brand new home probably is not going to provide that to you. Now, what nobody tells you, which, which, which does, does not appear in print anywhere when it comes to selling someone a home, is the cost that a resale sale house has over a brand new home. You have to understand, a brand new home is, is literally brand new. So all of the features of the home, the roof, the carpets, the kitchen, the, the wall treatments, uh, the driveway, um, everything is brand new. There's deck in the house. It's brand new. So if, if you are going to enjoy the full life cycle of each of those assets of your home, when you're buying a resale home, those assets all are at a certain stage in their, in, in their, their uh, life cycle. Maybe the, the driveway is already 10 years in, and you're going to have to put a new driveway in at 15. Okay, well, that's five years away, and that is a major expense. Maybe your roof of the house that you're buying looks absolutely stunning. They put 25, 30-year shingles on, but you find out that roof is 12 years old. It has already gone through over half because the, the way that they do the uh, shingle warnings are, are people replace them. People replace the roofs before they need to be replaced because they get what home buyers say is ugly. Maybe you've got a roof that's already 50% gone. 50% of its value is, is gone. 
the, your, your, if you're buying a house that is 20 to 25 years old, odds are it has not had a major renovation. Right at the time where the old color schemes, uh, fixtures, uh, uh, trim, um, those items are no longer um, what today's home buyer wants. So they all need to be replaced. This one is easy for anybody who remembers dusty rose carpets or uh, teal green uh, wallpaper or uh, laminate uh, formica countertops and cupboards, cupboard doors, laminate formica. Um, those things all quickly went away 10, 15 years later, and people spent tens of thousands of dollars in their kitchens renovating them. Ceramic, hardwood, carpet, all need to be replaced. So the simple answer is a brand new home is going to cost you less over your first 15 years of ownership than a resale home does. Your resale home is going to cost you more. And what realtors don't want to have you do and what the banks don't want to have you do and what the, the, any real estate stakeholder doesn't want to have you do is sit down and calculate what your budget is going to be over the next 15 years, the first 15 years of ownership of your home. And if you don't do that, if you buy a home without going through the first 15 years of ownership expense, and this includes condos, folks, then you're making a huge mistake. It's why when people tell us they're going on realtor.ca and look at listings, well, Realtor.ca never lays out the ownership expense that those properties are forecasted to have. We have some pretty sophisticated software, which is primarily uh, was designed for the property management field, and we have altered all the variables, all the all of the uh, all of the factors that we apply against each of the items. And we're able to come up with, with a cost for, for virtually any property. Your brand new home is probably other than personal choice, i.e., we want to put a fence in, we want to put a garden in, we want to put a better de- bigger deck in, we want to uh, paint the walls. Your brand new home is not going to force you to have an expense. You may have some costs because you want to do it, but there's going to be no expenses probably. The resale home, depending on which home you're buying, can have ownership expenses over the next 15 years that can cripple you financially. They can wipe you out. It can force you to sell the home and move on. It can force you to walk away from home equity, lose home equity. That's the reality of buying a home. You need to look at your 15-year forecasted housing expense, and decide whether or not that is a viable choice for you to make. Ross, thank you so much for chatting with us. Thanks for having me on, Jim. My guest has been home ownership consultant Ross K. from the wealthyhomeowner.ca. If you have any questions for Ross or any of our other guests, you can send them to info at howstreet.com. Find us on Twitter at Howstreet, our YouTube channel, Talk Digital Network. I'm Jim Goddard. Thank you for listening. Comments made on HowStreet.com radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. HowStreet.com radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.